Zed and I affirm, our first argument is the Dragon Warrior. Schumann 22 finds that China will never accept an independent Taiwan, which they consider as being occupied by an illegitimate government. Even where Schumann explains that the Ukraine crisis has shown the U.S. won't fight for others, leading Frank 22 to confirm that China has plans to invade Taiwan as soon as next fall. Because the U.S. lacks credibility, Murano 21 finds that strengthening Japanese capabilities is the best way to deter China. Unfortunately, Dorf 20 finds that Article 9 currently prevents Japanese military preparedness for defensive and deterrence purposes. Preventing an invasion is key, as Lauder 13 warns that, Japan, that Taiwan could trigger a nuclear war between China and the U.S. by miscalculation. This is because the legitimacy of both the Communist Party and the U.S. defense commitments depends on Taiwan. Our second argument is a toy story. Akimoto 30 write, 20 writes that Japan's space policy has been restricted by Article 9, and Japan was forbidden to develop military satellites. This pulled the linchpin of missile defense, as Marquinhos 07 explains that early warning satellites capable of detecting an incoming missile are forbidden due to the military nature of such advanced systems. Revision is key, as Fadden 20 explains that Article 9 prevented these self-defense forces from creating information-gathering satellites, a prerequisite for its missile defense system. The impact is nuclear defense. Herald 17 notes that Japan's participation in the Missile Defense Network is extremely important because the current network does not cover the Western Pacific and Asian regions like North Korea and China. This is critical because Borger 18 finds that the broadening of nuclear contemplation and a lack of communication between nuclear powers makes the chance of nuclear use the highest it's been since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Our third argument is the Lion King. Pfeffer 19 of the IPS writes that the United States is losing its status as a Pacific power. Instead, China has become a dominant economic and military player in East Asia. Koga 17 writes that if the status quo continues, China will be able to exert more influence, shift the regional balance of power, and reformulate the U.S.-led system. Luckily, Bland 20 explains that Japan looks well-placed to counterbalance China as Southeast Asian countries see Japan as the region's most trusted external partner. However, revising Article 9 is necessary for countering China in two ways. Subpoint A is regional resistance. Ains 21 reports that China is challenging its neighbors' energy activities within their own sovereignty. China has disputes over land and sea territory with most of its neighbors on a regular basis. Unfortunately, Citrus 18 finds that no single member of the Association of Southeast Asian Countries has the military strength to challenge China. With an Article 9 revision, the organization can now leverage Japanese power to challenge China directly. Military power allows the credible enforcement of such international law. Regional diplomacy is key, as Valesco 13 finds that regional organizations are six times more likely to craft an agreement that is not broken for at least five years. Subpoint B is a better alternative. Already, Southeast Asian countries like Malaysia are decreasing Japanese influence. Nikki 22 finds that Malaysia will become more reliant on Chinese trade and investment. Luckily, Lee 14 notes that Japan's militarization enables the creation of a new alliance system. Weaker Asian countries will oppose China if a dwindling U.S. has support from a stronger Japan anchoring multilateral alliances. Smith 21 confirms that for states to entertain balancing, there must be countries powerful enough to resist the rising power and provide security alternatives. The impact is a Game of Thrones. Sullivan 20 states that China will try to establish a regional hegemony in the Pacific and push U.S. military forces farther and farther away from China's shores. He furthers that China is gearing up to contest America's global leadership. Al-15 notes that war between China and the United States is more likely than not when a rising power like China is threatening a ru ruling power like the United States. Crisis that otherwise would be contained can initiate a cascade of reactions that escalate. Devastatingly, Thompson 21 finds that in a war, China may resort to nuclear use because they have no way of determining whether an attack is nuclear or conventional. Beijing may launch its nukes before they think they are potentially destroyed. And the APA 13 finds that war involving less than 0.5% of the world's nuclear weapons would still threaten 2 billion lives. Thus, we negate. We, we affirm. My bad. Evidence on your contention to saying that J Japanese. Info gathering satellites are key. Yep. All right. All right. Uh, Zed's putting that in the email. All right. Can you also say? Can you also send the evidence saying that China will launch a nuclear strike? Uh, like they can't differentiate, so that will cause them to preemptively attack. Uh, sure. Yeah. With okay. Nukes. Sure. Uh, the missile evidence is sent. Okay. Yeah, the satellite evidence has been sent. And all right, I'm getting the nuclear evidence. All right. 
Cool. All right, that's been sent as well. I'll let you know when we get the. I got the first one. All right. Is everyone ready for the NAG case? Okay. We need a contention one is foreign aid. Article nine has turned Japan into the fourth largest aid donor globally. Faroga 05 finds that foreign aid is the pillar of Japanese diplomacy. The government uses economic assistance to influence policies in developing countries due to the fact that all military actions are prohibited by Article nine. Revision provides Japan a militaristic alternative. Hang 19 argues that revising Article nine could undermine decades of international aid flows. Japan may lose incentives to make contributions because they don't need to rely on soft power when they head shift to hard power. Addison 15 contends that infrastructure investment can lift millions out of poverty. Japan, with its experience, should continue to make a major contribution. Contention two is security guarantees. U.S. alliances stand strong. Me 22 explains that overbearing Chinese policies in the Pacific have strengthened U.S. alliances, and Russia's threats to Ukraine are reminding Europeans why Washington is a good ally. Revising Article 9 reverses this in two ways. Scenario one is the blame game. Asian allies pursued constitutional revision as U.S.-led, causing intense backlash. Kaufman 08 explains that Japan's revision of Article 9, viewed against the backdrop of nationalism, would have consequences for U.S. relations with Japan's neighbors. If it appeared that Japan rearmed because of U.S. support, the U.S. could find itself ostracized by vital allies like Korea and Thailand. Scenario two is capping confidence, affirming signals that Japan does not trust America's military. Wadsworth 19 explains that offensive capability could be interpreted by neighbors as a sign that Tokyo is losing confidence in the U.S. This could start a chain reaction that causes more U.S. allies to develop their own strike capabilities, increasing instability. Reduced confidence spills over globally. Ola 21 explains that the Asia Pacific plays an important role in international affairs, home of half the world. The world order will be shaped by politics of the Asia Pacific, and the U.S. has to play its role. Confidence is key. Brand 17 explains that U.S. alliances deter aggressors by raising the possibility an attack will mean the fight with the world's most formidable military, adding that security guarantees allow allies to underbuild their militaries and avert the arms races and security competitions in earlier eras. Thus, Barnett 11 finds that the U.S. military resulted in a 99% drop in deaths due to war, and Man 14 finds that reduced allied confidence in America's security guarantee could cause instability with weapons of mass destruction. Contention three is constitutional chaos. Sub 1A is modeling. Article 9 has pacified East Asia. Tonneson 17 explains that Article 9 is deeply embedded in East Asian peace, but its key role has never been recognized. Article 9 has hugely contributed to East Asia's pacification by creating a model of national peaceful development. Empirically, Tonneson 14 furthers that in the years 1946 to 79, 80% of people killed in war were in East Asia. Since 1990, Japan and Article 9 are the vanguard of that story, concluding that if it were to be revised, this would destabilize the region. In that event, Selene 13 warns that in vicious circle, just regional tensions fuel each other in East Asia, escalating into a global conflict. Besides risking millions of lives, Dow 15 concludes that an extra power war would involve nuclear weapons inviting miscalculation. Subpoint B is a revision spiral. Despite occasional reinterpretation, the CFR 20 explains that for 70 years, Japan's constitution has remained untouched, a symbol of a democratic society. Breaking this taboo would create a storm of constitutional amendments. Sterling 20 explains that if Article 9 is revised, all other clauses would also need to be revised because all clauses of the Japanese constitution are interconnected. Japan's right-wing LDP would take advantage, turning Japan authoritarian. Gordon 93 explains that revision of Article 9 would open the door to conservative revision of other parts of the national charter concerning guarantees of individual rights and the status of the emperor, concluding that constitutional revision is the most dramatic concern about democracy in Japan. Specifically, Takahashi 16 confirms that the LDP's draft revised constitution is a model for dictators everywhere. Rights would be restricted while authorities enjoy unfettered power. This would be devastating. Solus 21 explains that Japan plays a central role to rekindle liberal internationalism. The country boasts one of Asia's oldest democracies, concluding that Japan's credentials matter more than a time of widespread democratic backsliding. This breeds existential threats as Diamond 19 confirms that the main threats to security all stem from authoritarianism, whether supporting international terrorism, proliferating weapons of mass destruction, or threatening neighbors. Thus, please negate. All right, cool. Ready for crossfire? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll start time now. In your last argument, you state that all the clauses of Japan's constitution are sort of intertwined, and if they change Article 9, they need to change the rest. So specifically, like which articles of Japan's constitution will need to be changed or revised? 
we say that every single one of the Constitution, every single article of the Constitution would have to be revised because our evidence indicates that they're all interconnected. This is because Article right. 9 is so key that it concerns the Japan's development and its military and its international relations. That is why, for example, Article 96 would also have to be revised. Can I have a so question? what does Article 96 say? Uh, I can give you the direct like quote of what the Article 96 says, but specifically it just says that it talks about the revision process, for example. Can I have a question? Yeah. Wait. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll get back to this later. You can have a question. Yeah. So let's talk about your case regarding a Taiwan invasion, right? Why does the fact that Japan gets more weapons mean that China is deterred from invading Taiwan, which is a completely other country independent of Japan? So specifically, we say that once Japan is able to create offensive capabilities and create a better deterrence posture, it disincentivizes China from actually going ahead and invading Taiwan because doing but so- But Japan would is not value. Taiwan, right? Yeah, I understand Why is there any deterrence? Again, because if China were to invade Taiwan, they would be facing Japanese resistance, which would make it very, very costly. And so they wouldn't do it in the first place. And this is only possible when we revise Article 9. Let's get back to your argument about like revisions. So yeah, a long, a long time ago, I remember reading Article 96, right? And it's about the process of an amendment. All Article 96 says is one, for an amendment to happen, there needs to be two thirds of like the Japanese diet, their parliamentary system, and then also a general vote with the majority of people supporting the amendment. So if Article 9 is passed, why would Article 96 need to be revised? Sure. So two things, right? Regarding the two like conditions you have for the two thirds and the public referendum, we said that one, insofar as the resolution says we must have to pass this one amendment and it requires amending all other amendments. This means that all other amendments would be passed. Yeah. And even if you want to say that there will be other requirements, such as the two thirds, our evidence indicates that because the Nationalist Party is currently in power in Japan, they're able to circumvent these, re these revisions. That's why, for example, Article 96 will be revised. Now oh. let's take a question because I already answered right. it. So let's talk about your argument on, for example, Toy Story and space satellites, right? You say there's a lack of nuclear communication right now, so we need satellites. Why can't nuclear hotlines solve back for this communication? Like countries can just talk to each other on the phone through nuclear hotlines and not nuke each other. Why do they need satellites? So like Japan doesn't have a nuclear hotline with other countries because they aren't a nuclear Wait, hotline. The yes, they do. But also, they do have a remember that? Hotline and they do okay. have satellites. The only thing is these satellites aren't offensive. But that doesn't matter in the terms yeah. of communication. So why is offensive okay. satellites necessary okay. to communicate? Miscommunication is also concerning like rogue actors like right now in like North Korea and a lack of communication they between have them. And no, they do not. We'll ask for that evidence later. All right. So before my rebuttal speech, I need to see that Japan apparently has a nuclear hotline. All right, at least 20 seconds. Uh, we will resume prep once we see the evidence. Let me open up the email chain. Uh, it's set now. Cool. All right, cool. We're resume prep starting now. All right, that was 52 seconds of prep use. Is anyone not ready? So the order of the speech is just going to go top down their case, and I'll be comparing arguments uh, in between. Anyone not ready? All right, cool. Time starts.
Now, start on their argument about foreign aid, there are a bunch of problems. First, their Faroka evidence agrees that there are other causes for why J Japan would want to give foreign aid, which means that even if diplomacy is one of them, they're probably just going to find others. Article 9 is not the only barrier. Second, there are only two countries that give over a billion dollars in foreign aid. Japan is number four on that list. It's foreign aid is completely marginal. It doesn't have any effect. This thing about infrastructure doesn't apply. They don't quantify how much Japan gives to infrastructure. Also, remember that our evidence from Swanson indicates that foreign aid is actually bad because it makes the di dictators who get the foreign aid less dependent on support from their people, which is why Dembisa Moyo indicates in her award-winning book that when foreign aid to Africa was at its highest, authoritarianism and poverty was at the highest point that it's ever been in 60 years, which means that their argument is a reason to vote for us. But let's go on their second contention about security guarantees at the top on blame games. Remember, this thing about how countries are going to perceive the United States, perceive Japan remilitarizing as a direct threat is a little bit silly, specifically because our um, uh, Tetris evidence from 2010 indicates, indicates that when Japan revises Article 9, they're going to be able to use the posture to clarify their, their offensive weapons to their other allies, which includes being able to make amends for the things that they did in the past. That's very important because it means that no country is going to be afraid of Japan insofar as they're going to go back and renounce that what they did in things like the Second World War. So no countries in the region are going to be afraid of Japan, Japanese militarization. But more specifically, if this link is true and the United States supports Japanese militarization, that turns their second link insofar as countries would see that Japan is doing what the United States told them to for decades at a time, which is very important because that actually increases support in the United States alliance system, which means that their second link is a reason to vote for us. But more specifically, on the second link, our evidence indicates that U.S. alliances in the region are waning, as proven by their own uniqueness evidence, which concludes that the United States is trying to take a more isolation foreign, isolationist foreign policy. But affirming would directly solve this because the Krebs evidence indicates that allies in the region will be happy when Japan revises Article 9 because now that means there are more forces within the U.S. security umbrella that can be diverted towards their defense. There are two implications here. One is short circuits their argument, and it's a reason to vote for us, primarily because countries perceive the United States redistributing physical forces as a greater like symbol of the United States credibility as opposed to some innate perception that the United States is weakening. But the second reason why it's important to prefer this argument is because on historical precedent, countries like Israel, India, Pakistan have proliferated without causing nuclear proliferation cascades like you talk about. Their argument is historically improbable. Lastly, on this argument about weapons of mass destruction, I urge you not to vote in this argument. They never contextualize what type of weapons of mass destruction would be developed. I'd argue that W MDs like chemical and biological weapons are internationally condemned. No country is going to want to try to buy them. But also, a brief piece of weighing here. There are infinite ways for countries to perceive international relations and even more ways for them to respond. There's no way to know what countries are going to do. Meanwhile, there's only ever going to be one cause of a nuclear war, and that is hegemonic transitions that escalate 12 out of 16 times, which means that you prefer our arguments here. Let's go to their third argument about constitu constitutionality. On their first argument about modeling, their evidence on this subject is horrible. First, it's from 2018. It's eight years old, outdated. 2014, it's eight years old, outdated. Our evidence indicates that the United States uh, re influence in the region is waning, and also countries are proliferating right now because North Korea has escalated to levels that, we've levels that we've never seen before. But then second of all, their evidence says, says that it's been peaceful since 1990s, isolating after the Korean War, in addition to after the Cold War. The United States hegemony has nothing to do. The United States hegemony has been the linchpin of peace in the region, which means that if we win a link into decreasing United States hegemony, that means that this modeling argument innately flows up. And the reasoning is truly quite simple. It's because if countries perceive that the United States is becoming less credible, it doesn't matter if they're going to look up to Japan as a model. They're going to care for their own national security first, so they're going to develop offensive of weapons regardless. Lastly, on this argument about a revision spiral, this argument makes no sense. Rahul asked them in cross what is going to happen in terms of revision. They couldn't give you a single example of what's going to be revised. This argument is incredibly ambiguous. Don't let them apply it. It also makes no sense why revising Article 9 leads to revision in other areas, specifically because a constitution is one entity. It's not decentralized. Revising one Article 9 does not mean revising everything else. But more specifically, our evidence indicates that nationalism is at an all-time high. This means this law argument logically flows F. If an unpopular policy is passed, i.e. Article 9, that means that the rule ruling party is going to get ousted, which means that in the long term, Japan becomes less nationalist in a world in which you pass Article 9. It's a very clean ballot for the app. Uh, can we see this proliferation right now on yep. modeling? Can you also see that Japan becomes less nationalist once you affirm? That was off the top, but I'll see if I have any evidence for that. Oh, okay. I mean, if you didn't reference any, it's fine. Yeah, it's off the dome.
Um, what you asked for has been sent. What's in my get it? This came through for me. Soul, did you get it? Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll hold up my timer to show when I start my prep. Use 25. All right, order of my speech is just going to be responding to their rebuttal and then responding to their case. Is everybody ready? Okay, let's begin now. On our argument on A, they say there's different reasons why they give A to our arguments when you in revised Article 9, they have no more incentive because they can just use their hard power. They say it's bad. Our evidence is Japanese uh, infrastructure aid has lifted millions out of poverty because they have specific oversight programs to prevent it going from dictators. On our argument about security guarantees, their first response is really actually silly about using our posture. This is ludicrous. There's no warrant as to why affirming means Japan apologizes for war crimes. The LDP and nationalist parties who would be in power in their world have had no proposals that say for doing this. Moreover, even if they say they won't aggressive, they're building offensive military weapons that deters and angers actors in the region. Then they say that it's contradictory, but our is just two different scenarios. Countries can perceive policies in different ways. Our argument is countries in the region would either perceive it this way or the second way, either of which would lead to a decrease in the U.S. security influence. They tell you influence would uh, increase, but our evidence says due to increased alliances right now, the U.S. security guarantee is the highest ever, which is why even in the long term, affirming might increase resources. It's our argument short circuits because since they don't like the Japanese policy and the U.S extension, they immediately leave the U.S. in the short term. They tell you WMDs is no contextualization. Our argument is about they can um, lead to instability with nuclear weapons and that the U.S. security guarantee protects countries, so it's decreased conflict by 99%, which is why it's empirically proven, because when we decreased our security guarantee to countries like Saudi Arabia, they lashed out. On modeling, they say there's proliferation. Their evidence about North Korea missile tests, our evidence says the entire region is peaceful now. They say it's from the U.S., but our evidence says the Japanese model was the reason why there's been a 70% chance in conflict, not the U.S., on our argument revision file, remember, their first response doesn't respond to it because our evidence says conservatives can hijack revision and pass amendments in provisions that decrease civil liberties, which is why the Constitution is interconnected. So we would have to do amendments for all other parts of the Constitution when we affirm. Lastly, our evidence says affirming would strengthen nationalists because they are the party that is supporting revision. That is why our evidence says historically increasing defensive spending in Japan has increased nationalism, not the other way around. At that point, go to their first argument on Taiwan. China won't invade as Gibson 22 explains that Taiwan accounts for 92% of global semiconductors. If a conflict interrupted their supply, would dramatically slow China's AI and 6G ambitions. And even more so, Lopez 22 explains because Russia's invasion has gone poorly, Chinese officials are cautious about sending troops into Taiwan. But Japan can already deter now, as Wadsworth 19 argues if Japan desires deterrent, then BMD should suffice. The country's BMD system has deterred any attacks. But affirming cause this conflict, as Anthony O2 writes, any change in Article 9 would be immediately be perceived in Beijing as a clear signal Japan has succumbed to nationalist forces, and Horning 21st of China would preemptively strike Japan before they get any deterrence. On their argument on space, one, their fat and evidence says they already use U.S. satellites. Japan doesn't need any. Even more so, Pike 20 writes Japan already has eight intelligence gathering satellites in orbit. They can just use the intel for defensive purposes, article and prevent. Lastly, you can turn it because fat contextualizes, affirming could materialize through Japan getting offensive space weapons, which Chang O'Nai would start a space race and increase Chinese militarization. And due to miscalculation, Mitchell 1 continues that this buildup and make war inevitable. Any nation subjected to a space attack would retaliate with nuclear weapons. They've also conceded all these countries have hotlines, meaning there's no nuclear war or there. On their argument on China, one, the U.S. is already solving this. Corbyn from March indicates Biden has sought to empower key allies to contribute to collective bargaining in the Indo-Pacific, which is why Yamaguchi 22 finds Japan has already expanded security with partners that share its concerns about China. Moreover, China can't aggress because Yang 22 writes, Beijing cultivated an opposition to itself. Asia will increasingly become more unified against China now. China cannot disrupt the status quo. On subpoint A, affirming ruins cooperation. As ISTP 18 writes, an amendment to Article 9 would ignite protest amongst neighbors to the historical association of Japanese imperialism. Moreover, 
IED Law 08 writes, Article 9 prohibits forces to settle international disputes. This plan played an important role in establishing trust between Japan and the region. On their set point, be their uniqueness evidence is terrible. It says Malaysia is becoming more reliant on trade because U.S. banned Malaysian rubber imports returned to China. Nothing about China's hegemony. And secondly, all the terms I just read, the apply to their sub point B. Their links are functionally saying about increasing regional cooperation. If anything, Wadsworth 19 writes, at a time where trilateral cooperation is important to deter Japan militarizing what alienated alien South Korea and force them to hedge with Beijing. Lastly, their impact is a huge contradiction. If we assume their argument that China pushes out U.S. troops in, their, in our world, then they can't get into a war now. Thus, we negate. All right, can we see the second response on regionalism? regionalism? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, oh, I set it. All right, uh, we can start for us, we're good. All right, you mind if I get okay. the first question? Yeah, sure. Time starts now. How many, how much infrastructure has been built because of Japanese aid? I can't tell you the amount of steel pipes they use, but what I can tell you is our evidence says they lift millions out of poverty. Can I have a question? Is um, your evidence the infrastructure specifically lifts people out of poverty yes. or Japanese yeah. investment specifically? Japanese infrastructure aid lifts millions out of poverty. Can I have a question? Mm -hmm. Insofar as the only example you give about any country turning towards Chinese influence is about Malaysia becoming more dependent on Chinese rubber imports, how does that at all prove that China's increasing influence now at the point to the point at which it leads to a nuclear war? First of all, the reason why Malaysia is turning towards China is because, as you say yourself, the United States is not doing trade in the region and we're gradually It says, wait, wait, that's really different, right? Your <laughs> argument is there's a nuclear war between China and the U.S. Your evidence says that China or Malaysia is becoming more dependent on China for rubber imports. Like how at all does that translate to an extinction level event? Okay, so I think you're drawing a parallel between two entirely different things, right? First, our argument is about Chinese expansionism, not necessarily into countries, but also into territorially disputed waters, which is independently pushing back U.S. spheres of influence. Okay, but here's the thing. Your only example of that getting doing something in the region with another ally is them increasing rubber trade. There is no contextualization as to how the increase in influence now is meeting any bright line that would necessitate a nuclear transition. Sully, you've interrupted me several times throughout this crossfire. I'm going to finish my statement. Okay, sure. I just wanted to clarify something. Yeah, you can go ahead. I will clarify that if you give me the chance, right? Yeah. Our argument is truly quite simple. Malaysia might be, I don't know, maybe you think it's a bad example, but our evidence says that, first of all, rubber is a pretty big industry in Malaysia. So if they're transitioning towards China, probably means that like in the long term, they're becoming more economically dependent on China. But then second of all, rubber might just be, our argument is that rubber is like a microcosm of other countries turning towards China for other industries, for example. Also, once again, it's about spheres of influence into territory I mean, waters not just countries but i'm gonna I think, yeah i just think yeah sure about your argument about um about revision spiral okay once again can you give me one democratic yes. liberty that's going to be impinged upon if the if yes the evidence the mind? evidence says the gordon evidence you read says it would decrease civil liberties and give the authorities unfettered power over the people I, i'm, I'm asking you for an example of a civil liberty that would be impinged upon uh like it like our evidence says that the change in amendment would be so wide that would lead unfettered control over the public right freedom of speech you know freedom of protest literally anything like of like our evidence is extremely good in saying that for example the current proposals that the ldp have in in the instance that we would revise the entire constitution would be models for dictators everywhere because it would basically decrease you know a, um, the civil rights of people all across the board right okay. so it's not only one proposals? like civil right it's that the government would get unfettered power which leads to more nationalism and leads to more authoritarianism but that's cool. not yeah okay so, sorry about the echo um i want to take some prep time before summary i'll start that now
Cool. Uh, we have 30 seconds left of prep. We'll save that for the last speech. All right. So again, this is the affirmative summary from mission. I'll start off on the negative case, basically responding to our, all our opponent's arguments, and then going back to our arguments and defending them. All right. If everyone's ready, then I'll begin. Let's start on their first argument about foreign aid. Remember what Zed tells you in rebuttal is that there's so many other reasons as to why Japan would want to give foreign aid and have good relations with other countries. They tell you that there's no more incentive because now they can use military hard power. Well, that's very, very expensive, right? They don't want to risk war with every single other like developing country in the world. They'd rather just do like diplomacy through foreign aid like they're doing right now. And also Japan barely gives any military aid. They're ranked fourth in the top two countries. The U.S. gives the majority. There's absolutely no impact here. Let's go to their second contention about the security. I'll also deal with this on our third argument because a lot of these arguments are very similar and interrelate. And you prefer ours because their own evidence tells you a few things. One, the U.S. would support Japan's constitutional revision and other countries would perceive the U.S. as supporting Japan now creating offensive militaries, which is very, very important because all these other countries in Southeast Asia, like South Korea and stuff, as of now actually support Japan militarizing because they think that now with Japan having an offensive military, they can stop threats like China and North Korea from actually expanding and taking advantage of their own sovereignty and borders, making the U.S. credibility only stronger in the long term. Let's look to their last argument about this constitutional Constitution stuff. They first tell you that Japan's a really, really important model, but remember that for peace and modeling, their own evidence tells you that this only was that their like peak and peace was really, really good after the 1990s, which was when the Cold War ended and the U.S. literally escaped the like hegemonic wars between the Soviet Union and the U.S. That's very, very important because it literally sets up the weighing for you, right? If the U.S. winning the hegemonic war in the Cold War proves that this is the greatest link into stability in the middle in the uh, East Asian region, then winning our third argument about maintaining U.S. credibility is the best way to maintain peace in the region. Finally, on their last argument about revision spiral, there's absolutely zero clarity here. They don't cite you a single article of Japan's constitution apart from Article 96, which I've already responded to, because even if Article 9 is amended and these nationals don't actually gain power, which I'll respond to later, there's actually nothing in the Japan's constitution that's actually contradictory with Article 9. They have not given you a single article or any link from uh, Japan's constitution. At that point, let's go to our case. You're voting on our contention three. It's very simple. Right now, the US power in the Pacific is waning right now, and China's taking advantage and expanding further. On the status quo, the current path we're on, Chinese expansionism will be able to provoke conflict and draw the US into a potentially nuclear war, threatening 2 billion lives, which again is the biggest argument in the round. The only solvency here is that through our subpoint B about a better alternative. We tell you that Japan can anchor multilateral alliances and replace Chinese reliance and provide better security. In response, they first tell you that like Biden's actually empowering our alliances, but this clearly has not worked. Our Olson Evans post states and tells you that Biden's actually failed and that right now all these countries are still fending for their own security and they do not trust the United States, especially after the Ukraine crisis. Their next response is that trade with rubber is not that big. That's definitely not true. Our evidence also tells you about Chinese investment, not just trade and also territorial disputes over energy and islands. And finally, they tell you that they would alienate South Korea, but the Hayes Evans, which post-states tells you that South Korea actually supports Japan revising the constitution again because it helped deter China, one of their main threats. They finally tell you that this would push out the United States, but our hegemonic transition scenario always concedes the fact that the United States would be able to escalate conflicts and China would be provoking them. On our first and second arguments, all these responses are very contradictory. The defense takes it all out. Uh, Can you send the evidence saying that like South Korea wants Japan to yeah. make weapons? Yeah, that allies want Japanese yeah, okay. militarization and whatever evidence you says postdates ours that Biden has failed. All right, I'll get that. All right, um, I sent the thing about US alliances and the, Hayes and the Hayes evidence about South Korea. Did you also want other Southeast Asian countries or just South Korea? Uh, so just Southeast Asian countries. Okay, yeah. I'll get that as well.
All right, that's also been sent. Just got it. So did you get the evidence? All right. We're going to take some prep. Give it a timer. Starting. Okay, that was an additional two minutes. So we have 35 seconds for plus. All right. Is everyone ready? Okay. Order is going to be starting on the neg. Then I'll do Wang, explain why our arguments come first. And then I'll respond to their argument on China. So if everyone's ready, then I'll begin. The most important argument from our case in our first our second argument about security guarantees, specifically our first scenario about blaming the United States. Our argument is very simple. We said that the United States alliance system is strong due to global aggression reinvigorating its resolve to protect allies. Conversely, revision will be perceived as nationalist aggression by allies and backed by the United States, forcing these allies to ostracize the U.S. collapsing Asian influence, the linchpin to American global influence due to its huge popularity, uh, population and global military hub, negating as key as U.S. alliances deter adversaries and protect allies, decreasing conflict by 99% globally, saving hundreds of millions of lives. They give you two responses. First, they say that the United States supports Japan. This is our argument. We say that allies don't like that. That's why they blame the United States. Second, they say that South Korea supports Japan as well. Bunch of problems here. Number one, we said that the warranty always comes to our side because we said that in, during World War II when Japan had a military, they committed many historical atrocities. That's why our current allies in East Asia are scared of Japan getting allied weapons right now. But second, we said that these allies perceive it as a nationalist policy. That's why they blame the United States and Japan. And third of all, their evidence just says that they're supporting Japan right now. That changes when you affirm because Article 9 is no longer in place. Now, let's do the way as to why our argument on security guarantee comes first. We say that our argument comes first on cooperation, on time frame, because we say that as soon as revision happens, these countries get scared, meaning that even if Japan can and want to increase cooperation in the long term, it doesn't happen when you affirm because no countries want to cooperate. It has to be reciprocal. At that point, let's look to their argument and as to why their arguments are not true. 
They really mishandled the overall response that Sully reads in rebuttal. What Sully says is that China is not aggressing right now because Biden and Japan are already doing regional cooperation with other East Asian countries. Insofar as that's already happening in the status quo, there's no reason for you to revise Article 9. That's really key. They said that Biden is pulled out. No, our evidence is from last month and is more recent, saying that Biden is actually cooperating with these East Asian allies to deter China. So if anything, U.S. Uh, security guarantee is high right now. But second, they fully concede the turn on preemptive strike. We say that as soon as Japan starts developing their own offensive capabilities, China sees that as an offensive, uh, as an existential threat, and that's how they'll preemptively strike Japan, causing this all-out war. Insofar as you don't see war happening right now, the only risk of this war happening is when you vote for my opponents. That's why you don't want to vote for them. Then, finally, let's look onto their argument specifically about China. There's a few problems here. Number one, remember that they can see that Japan will no longer have an incentive to use soft power. They no longer have an incentive to do diplomacy, but instead they'll shift over to hard power. That is because they now have a military and they'll, it's way more cheaper to use the military than use diplomacy overall. But remember, they have literally no evidence as to why Chinese hedge is increasing right now. The only evidence they have is that Malaysia is importing more rubber from China. Think about it logically. There's no warranting as to why Malaysia, only their only example, importing more rubber means that suddenly Chinese hedge will overtake the United States and causing this all-out global war. Their argument is extremely improbable. You should not be voting for it. At the end of the day, insofar as diplomacy and cooperation is already happening right now, you don't need to revise Article 9. Okay. All right. Sorry, we're just switching audio for a second. Right, yeah, we'll get for first. yeah, y'all can have first question. All right, cool. You want a question? Yeah, sure. Time starts now. Okay, so you state that right now China isn't expanding. Um, and then if we revise Article 9, they're going to somehow preemptively strike Japan, right? So how do both of these arguments exist in the same world? So, so I can explain, right? We said that right now, China is very, very defensive, and they don't want to aggress right now. The reason behind this is because there's already regional cooperation without revising Article 9. However, once you revise Article 9, and Japan starts building a lot of weapons, a lot of offensive capabilities, that scares China. China sees that as an offensive, uh, as an existential threat. That's when pre that preemptively strikes. This right. was Okay. In summary, and it was a clean response on her side. All right. Can Again, this all depends on the fact that China has regional like alliances or diplomacy or whatever. But who are those with? No. But what do you mean China has regional alliances? Regional, our yeah. our evidence part, isolates. Oh, oh, like who they're cooperating with now? Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. So our the United States cooperating yeah. with other East Asian countries, yeah, like, not China. It's phenomenal. The evidence is very, very good in saying that as China has like been aggressive in the past a little bit, it's created this entirely new regional alliance system that is committed towards deterring Japan or deterring China, which is why your evidence that talks about Biden is from January of this year saying they didn't follow up with anything the Trump administration has done. Our evidence is from this month and is way more specific in indicating that yeah. cooperation already exists now. Okay, so again, this all relies also, on the fact that the U.S. is extending alliances into status quo. No, the second, the second response about preemptive strike does not rely on that at all. It relies mm -hmm. on the non responding to idea that China perceives Japanese militarization as a threat. And that's just like an objective fact insofar as you've never contested that idea. Well, I mean, our link kind of stands as a testament yeah. to that, right? The idea is that if Japan makes military alliances, then China can't yeah. afford to and, see it. Sully, can I finish? Yeah, sure, 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 sorry, sorry. I was just, <clears throat> yeah means that China can't see it as an existential threat because the cost would be too high, which is yeah. why they wouldn't be able to expand. We give Wait, this analysis. Two, two yeah, yeah. That, right? we, yeah cool. we give, yeah, well, I, I could get it if you want. Um, okay. Yeah, we give this analysis that says that, you know, to do regional cooperation, to do this diplomacy, it takes time. Our mm -hmm. argument is as soon as you affirm the path process of revision, um, China thinks is a threat, so they immediately preemptively strike. It's in the word preemptive. Okay. The they don't that, want to... If you know this, I'm pretty sure all of East Asia does as well. And if that's the, and the alliance, alliances will probably also be catalyzed just as fast. I mean, right? every time there is a threat, if that threat is existential, countries will probably band together faster now that there is an ally in the region to anchor those alliances. The alliances would probably occur at the same rate. I find it very difficult to believe that you have stumbled across some piece of analysis that East Asian policy analysts no. don't know, right? I think no, that's, the fact it's not that the, Japan yeah. developing weapons is a threat. Obviously, no other country will want to cooperate yeah. with Japan also, if they view Japan as a threat. Wait, really? On top of that, that's not really grounded in reality what you just said. It takes time for countries to do negotiations, to do diplomacy, to work work out all their differences. As soon as you affirm it's a unilateral action by China, it goes a lot faster. It's just, it's just one Zoom call away. One Zoom call. That's how the diplomacy works. All right, we have 30 seconds of prep. Um, let's start that now.
Okay. Um, it's going to start on our case, the weighing, and then their case. Time, we'll start. Now, start on our argument about the Lion King. It's pretty simple. Right now, China's expanded deeper than ever into the South China Sea, which is bad because they're pushing back the United States' spheres of influence. This is terrible because our evidence indicates that both superpowers right now are on track to a hegemonic transition period, which could lead to a nuclear war killing 2 billion people. Our evidence indicates that if Japan revises Article 9, it would be important because Japan could portend the creation of a new alliance system in East Asia to push back Chinese expansionism, preventing this conflict from ever happening. They give you four responses, but none of them actually take out our argument. They're first two responses says that China is not aggressing because Biden is doing a good job of making alliances. They say their evidence comes after ours. Don't look to recency comparisons. That doesn't adjudicate anything. What does adjudicate things is our analysis that tells you from Sidaris that even if these alliances are happening on paper, China is still physically expanding, which means that it doesn't matter if these alliances are happening. The U.S. alliance system is still structurally weak because China keeps expanding. What actions speak louder than words? Then they say that there's an existential threat and China would perceive that an attack. But they miss our analysis that if Japan bands together and creates this alliance system, which would happen the second you affirm, because all it takes is a small amount of diplomacy, which happens almost instantaneously, China could not perceive this as an existential threat. And also China is a rational actor. They can't start a conflict if they know that they're going to lose in the long term. More specifically, they claim that China has created this barrier that blocks them from being able to do diplomacy because it allies people against them. But they have conceded our analysis that even if countries are allied against China, they need Japan to anchor that alliance in the first place and actually unite them to push back against Chinese influence. At that point, go to the wing. They say they outweigh because their argument is on time frame, but they never tell you why you should prefer short-term impacts. We tell you prefer our argument on time frame because our argument is that a hegemonic transition period, which lasts for decades at a time, creating smaller regional wars, which A, link into their argument because it's a higher likelihood that countries want to develop offensive weapons. Two, our argument culminates in an impact that is larger than their two billion over some uncontextualized 99% decrease in death. But then third, and most importantly of all, remember, their analysis is entirely predicated on the idea that countries don't like Japan's proliferation, but their analysis is from World War II. Hayes 19 postdates and find that countries know that there are existential threats in the region, which is why they actually want Japan to proliferate. The round is very, very clean for the pro. Thank you for your time. Okay, we'll take remaining prep starting now. We have 35 seconds left. We're going to start. Order of my speech is going to be just top level comparison, our case and their case. Is everybody ready? Okay, uh, let's begin now. As we know, friendship is a two way street. We tell you this is really important in the context of revision, because as soon as revision happens, countries get scared of Japan, meaning even if Japan wants to increase cooperation with countries, countries don't want to increase cooperation with them, meaning our argument precludes theirs. If there's no cooperation from short-term harms, you can prevent conflict down the line. Really badly for them, they don't respond to the two reasons why this is true. One, as of right now in 2022, countries don't want Japanese remilitarization because the last time they remilitarized, it led to massive historical atrocities. And secondly, countries perceive Article 9 vision as a nationalist supported policy so they don't want to engage with a nationalist country who's going to be aggressive even if we have opposing evidence devolved to the logical explanations ours are more thorough grounded in history and most importantly grounded in logic let's tell you how affirming ruins this peaceful balance of peace the u.s alliance system is strong due to global aggression reinvigorating its resolve to protect allies conversely revision will be perceived by nash as nationalist aggression by allies and backed by the u.s forcing them to ostracize the u.s collapsing asian influence the linchpin to american global influence due to its huge population and global military hub. Negating is key. U.S. alliances deter adversaries and protect allies, decreasing conflict 99% globally, saving hundreds of millions of lives. Meaning if you vote for us, we can deter China altogether if you keep the U.S. strong. 
With that said, we're clearly winning our argument. We're winning our case. Let's explain why you can't avoid my opponents. There are so many hoops to get through. Remember, our evidence that postdates theirs from this month says that the U.S. and other countries in the region are already allying and preventing Chinese expansion. Of course, recency matters. Our evidence is more indicative of the current security environment. But even more so, their argument is ludicrous. The only example they can give is that Malaysia is becoming more dependent on Chinese rubber. There's no explanation as it leads to a global nuclear war or even why we need a military to call up up someone on Zoom and do diplomacy in the first place, diplomacy, diplomacy can exist now. If you don't believe anything I just said, remember the turn on preemptive strike. As soon as Japan militarizes, China thinks they're going to be attacked, so they preemptively strike Japan and cause a conflict. Looking into their argument, it takes time to do cooperation and build alliance. That preemptive strike happens as soon as you affirm. Thus, we negate. Good round. Good round. Good round. Thank, Good round. You for Thank you for judging. All right, um, the decision is in, so is everyone here? Yep. Right. So uh, congratulations to both teams for uh, making it to semis of TOC. Huge accomplishment. Um, it was a 2-1 for the NAG. And um, Mary, since you squirreled, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I went off based off of the leaf evidence. I thought um, it was strong enough to like warrant that other countries within the East Asian Pacific um, would want to support Japan and militarizing to like kind of counter Chinese aggression within the South China Sea and just like in Asia in general. Um, and then like in terms of like the historical context, the response from that, like, Yes, but also given the history that Japan has had as a pacifist country for the past like 70 years, I thought like was a good way to show like diplomacy is very easy. Like it, diplomacy hasn't built along the way for Japanese reassurances, that, like those atrocities wouldn't happen. Um, especially the second thing that when the NAG responded in terms of how like Malaysia is dependent on Chinese rubber and that like diplomacy could exist in both worlds. Like if diplomacy was so um, easy in either world, then like I didn't really buy into the idea that preemptive strike by China would happen um, if it's like just one Zoom call away. But yeah, that's where I'm at. Uh, I guess I can go next. Um, I voted NAG on security guarantees. I don't think like enough work was done by AF in the second half of the round to stop them from getting offense on this. But on the AF case, um, I buy the neg argument that there is like currently peace in the region through US cooperation and like other countries cooperating. I don't think the argument that like China's military is still expanding is sufficient to beat this back. Cause like uh, an expanding military doesn't really have anything to do with like the state of conflict in a region. And even though they're like still putting more money into their military, like it's not really like creating any issues in the status quo. Um, but I could have also voted off of the uh, preemptive strike turn. It flow, it's like pretty clear across the flow that China views Japan like militarizing as an existential threat. And the risk for a preemptive strike is like more likely. I feel like not enough work was done there to beat that turn back. So that's what I ended up voting on. Yeah, hi. Yeah, I think my main uh, reason for voting for NEG was uh... I mean, based on the emphasis and the evidence given, I, I, I couldn't believe the US confidence is gone to such a level that it's weakened. I mean, it's hard. I mean, I just couldn't kind of uh, get that. I mean, that was the main thing. If there was something from the AF team to emphasize that, I mean, again, the, the next alternate you guys are saying is a nuclear war between China and US. I mean, I don't think the evidence clearly kind of substantiated that. I mean, that, that was the main reason I would say it for Nick. All right, uh, thank you all for debating. Yeah, thank you for great round. Great round. Great round. Thank you all for judging as well. Brent, well, y'all better, better win now. All right, thank you. We will, we will. We'll try, we'll try. All right, thank you all.